moral decisions, to offer solutions, to offer hope, to offer thinking. So I really, really think that this type of work is instrumental and foundational, and I'm still incredibly thankful to Campbell for the great work that we did together to get them going. But it meant, because of that knowledge, that I was very much focused on these six priorities as we launched the, the center. First, yes, do map the infrastructure systematically so you can use the evidence more easily and you can track it over time. Great asset. Then create an evidence portal at speed without compromising on the evidence. So with colleagues at Campbell and also UCL that are sitting at the back of the room, we actually looked at the evidence standards for evidence portals across the globe to develop the ones for our own portal. We did that at speed. Both the maps and the evidence portal were ready uh, on day one, the center launched. Why? Because we knew that evidence users need something to use from day one. So we took that very seriously. Then, where enough studies existed, we commissioned the first systematic reviews um, in the field. We did so with colleagues from Queen's University Belfast, who are, I hope, somewhere in the room. A fantastic uh, work they did too. And where gaps existed, with, and there were numerous, we set about designing a list of research priorities. Both of those things obviously took time and would take time. So rather than just waiting until those outputs were ready, we made sure that we were positioning those outputs, if you like, within a wider system, because it's often a criticism of a what works approach. And we also started producing on the band and in anticipation of future needs evidence notes for people in power and for people with money. So we do think in terms of power structures, which links to that last point. All of the work that you see here was done with, not to, and we do think in terms of power structures. So when it was just a few of us, we always just prioritize where in the system is the most power, the most resource. If you help those individuals, those organizations, we can achieve more faster. And it's only over time that you start branching out to other stakeholders, if you like. This leads me to my next point, incredibly important to this work, win hearts and minds. It's really the linchpin to success. Um, we need to engage in empathy. We need to put ourselves in the shoes of the people we're trying to help, or you really can't get anything done. Um, we often talk about going from evidence to implementation, but we find it's crucial to empathize with the people you're trying to help. Um, to design any program that's going to be in any way useful. So just to give you examples of how we do that, we use storytelling uh, a fair amount. Why do we do this? Um, because it's a really powerful way of making the case for change. I'll give you some examples of the types of storytelling we deploy, if you like. We used it when uh, we were setting up the center, and we still do, to make the case for causal studies and rigorous synthesis. We also use it to elevate the great work that does happen and cultivate the desired mindset. And also uh, finally to challenge the stigma associated with homelessness. So just to give you a few examples, um, using cases like scare straight, I'm pretty sure I don't need to tell you what scare straight is. Um, so any program that was once perceived as highly effective, but ultimately discredited, were comp very, very compelling ways of getting people to quickly understand why this type of work matters. We find that leading with the why is incredibly important when it comes to any type of work to do with influencing. So uh, this really, really continues to be very powerful. People often come to us and they remember the stories you told you and they, uh, told them and they remember why it matters. This is another example. This is from a blog we published just last week. Uh, we feel that policymakers, practitioners who get it and get things done. So both things are incredibly important, by the way. So we go about recruiting people in the system with a reputation for both those, you know, those two things. 
and giving them a platform and working with them to help refine programs, et cetera, and design programs. So this, this is a, the CEO of a well-known charity in, in London. So this is the last post that we did from a champion that really highlights how he's using this mission to really improve the work that he's doing locally. So this is the type of thing that is really helpful and leaders like this often need help with the writing. So someone from the team would sit down with them and interview them and help capture that story. So again, it's a really useful thing both ways. Another example is this. Um, we really feel that evidence communications is key to challenging the stigma of homelessness. One of the many ways in which we're trying to do this is by creating a bank of images, evidence-based images that essentially were taken by people with lived experience and also um, you know, the people with lived experience then select what images become public. Uh, again, by doing this type of work and offering uh, the bank as a free resource is another small way in which people can easily become and act in an evidence-informed way. Um, so I hope, you know, this gives you a good sense of the types of storytelling that can make a difference. But we always knew from the beginning that you can't stop there, similar to things like the tools you need to go deeper in this type of work, you know? It's all about being useful, being trusted, and being liked. Another motto that, you know, I use a lot with the team. Um, which leads me to the next principle, you know, making others successful. Again, incredibly important um, thing to follow. A focus on being useful is fundamental to effective knowledge translation. It doesn't just enrich the end product, um, it really feeds into the idea, the quality of the idea, the quality of the research questions you're asking. It's a two-way thing. Um, and it's very much about developing those shared goals and that learning mindset that you want to see. So a quick example of the way in which we do that. Uh, so the center worked very closely with the treasury and the relevant government departments in the UK to inform the spending review negotiations. So we would do that by spending lots of time talking to, to them about the evidence behind any issues that they are exploring as part of their negotiations, but also by producing written briefings that can feed into that type of work. Last time that led to um, a really important um, three-year budget for homelessness. It never happened before. There are always, you know, 12 month uh, budgets. So a big step. And of course now, you know, we're doing that again and again, and we're trusted partners. Another example is this. Um, we kept hearing from different local partners that they're struggling to, uh, to understand how to make the best use of um, temporary accommodation, what's value for money. So as a result of that, of listening to people's concern, we launched the value for money program. So the Northern uh, Ireland Housing Executive were one of the first agencies to really come forward and want to work with us on this. So they've accepted our recommendations now and the next phase involves working with them to implement them. Final example, um, or two more in fact, is you know, uh, agents like the British Royal Family. I talked a lot about power and, and targeting those with influence. So this is a really good example. Um, this is a cause that's very close to the, to the Prince of Wales's heart. So we spent a good part of two years, you know, helping with the design of the Homewards program that was launched recently. Um, and because someone like him um, has the type of influence that no one else has, we hope that it will help us accelerate certain things that we were hoping to achieve um, already like challenging the stigma of homelessness. We don't feel anyone can do as good a job as, as, as he can, really. And just one more example, just to give you a good sense of the breadth of, of, uh, of work that this type of thing can involve. Um, when an affluent London neighborhood um, you know, came to us saying that they were hoping to do something about homelessness, they'd been thinking about it for a number of years, but they didn't know what to do. What we did was sit down with them and help them design a program, help them consider what their options were and cost those options. So we make it as easy as possible for people to be evidence driven and help them actually put plans in place to actually start acting on it. The outcome, um, they've now pledged to launch the program and you know, five million pounds is what they're aiming to raise in the first instance. 
Um, so a really, you know, interesting example there uh, as well. So I hope what this helps to illustrate amongst other things is this. This work is not about us. It's, it should never be about us. It's always about who's out there, who has influence in the system, how can we help them? Which lead, leads to the next point. We must adopt and inspire a humble mindset. So I've heard different people talk about that during the conference, which is fantastic and certainly resonates with our experience um, at the center. Um, and it's very much two sides you know, of the same coin. By, by, you know, doing as you say, it really inspires other people to do the same. And it's a very important part of growing the movement. Uh, let me give you an example. Um, it's not uncommon when we first go in and suggest ideas as to how people could become more effective, efficient, etc., to meet resistance. So this, is, this example here is, it was very much about us suggesting to the government that they adopt a clear definition of metrics for the policy commitment to end street homelessness. Um, and unsurprisingly, the minister was resistant to begin with. Um, we don't push, it's always disheartening when people don't get it initially, but we carry on. Um, this photo here was from um, an event that we did, you know, about a year later. And Eddie, uh, that minister, he was incredibly excited to be in a room with loads of people and we were preparing to launch a framework that local communities across the UK really, really embraced. So it's about persevering, uh, but, you know, knowing when to pick, you know, your time uh, as well. Um, so that's one example. Another example is very much the the, the evidence landscape. Um, so we're very pleased that since we launched the center that you can see here from this graph, there's been a huge growth. Um, but sadly, there's still a lot uh, of work to do. Um, certainly when it comes to homelessness, there's still less than 100 studies um, based in the UK. So still a huge amount of work to do. The good news is that recently uh, the government um, finally uh, commissioned the a really important program of work, the first Rawls program on, in homelessness in the UK, which is um, fantastic. So we're really looking forward to, to using that as a way of scaling innovation uh, and best practice. However, however, only eight trials, you know, can be done through a program like this. So unless this is like the precursor to future programs, the overall goal will be hard to achieve. Also, something that always keeps me grounded is this. Um, even though most of the evidence at the moment on what works in homelessness comes from the United States, they're actually a lot worse at preventing homelessness. The levels are a lot worse. So again, like Damon was saying, this work is a means to an end. So we want to make sure that we do, you know, the stuff that matters, which leads me to the, my final point. Whatever happens, it needs to be focusing on what matters or we make very little difference. So when it comes to social issues like homelessness, it's a very, very complex landscape. So it's very easy to essentially be, you know, working out what the right questions are to the wrong questions. So that's why this, you know, is so important. Just to give you a quick example, this is Salt Lake City. Um, you probably heard about um, how well they did in the early 2000s, reducing chronic homelessness really radically. Um, but, you know, the simplistic celebration um, in the news really hid a much more complex truth that other types of homelessness were still dramatically rising over that period of time. So what we always say is that ending homelessness, like other complex social issues, it's not rocket science. It's actually a lot harder. It's actually a lot harder. So we need to embrace that. We need to give ourselves a break. But we also need to be smarter and more systematic about how we go about tackling the system, which is why uh, at the center we developed uh, a causal loop diagram of, of homelessness early on and everything we do in relation to interventions needs to fit into this map and we're trying to integrate the EGMs with things like this uh, as well. 
Um, so just to start wrapping up, uh, this work isn't easy. Let's not pretend otherwise. But to do what we want to do, which is to achieve real lasting change, we need better evidence, but also better relationships and culture as well. It's not for nothing that there is such a thing as what I'm calling <laughs> the paradox of knowledge translation. If you look throughout history, the best examples of knowledge translation are also the best examples of evidence not influencing practice and policy. Why? Because these things can be very complicated. Here I have an image for obviously Galileo trying to persuade the Inquisition, but if you think of you know, tobacco, if you think of climate change, these are very complex issues. So just to wrap up, this journey um, of translating evidence into action can be filled with hurdles and setbacks, but rather than becoming disheartened, we need to make sure that we continue to be persistent, we continue to adapt, and frankly, I really believe that knowledge brokers have to be leading these efforts uh, in order to become, to stay relevant. Thank you. You'd agree with me that our panelists are doing tremendous work, not only in the global south, but as we have heard from the Center for Homelessness, uh, there is tremendous work that is being done. And I think, you know, in acknowledging that this morning, I think we could give them another round of applause. We have just about 10 minutes for questions. And so I'm going to start with a discussion question for our panelists. And I'm not picking on anyone, uh, but I'd like to pose my first question to our Global South partners. And uh, it, it is that it is true, and based on what you have said, that knowledge generation and mobilization is often influenced by those who fund it. And given the level of funding that the Global North provides for Global South initiatives, how have you navigated ensuring that the priority agenda is fitting for the people that the Global South initiatives are being designed for? And then I want to ask another question for uh, Ligia to consider, and then I'll allow the floor to give questions. You mentioned some startling facts. One I wrote down just now is the amount of money my government, uh, the US government spends on research for homelessness, but is actually doing worse at this than many other places. And so my question to you is, the evidence and the principles that you have used and that have worked for you, how are you working to collaborate and partner with other entities across the globe to ensure that there is translation of this level of success that you have seen in managing this global crisis of homelessness. So that's the first one? Yeah. So we can go, go, go around. Okay, thank you very much, Damien. I think the first question is very, very important. And uh, at times you look at it and you wonder, you know, how research are being done, but it's not, for nothing, you go to countries like Kenya, you go to countries like South Africa, you go to countries like uh, Ghana, attempts are being made for government policies to be shaped by evidence. Yes, the magnitude of funding have not reached the level where you can really, really see impact, but progress are being made. My problem or the challenge is not from the funders. The, the challenge is from, it's a demand and surprise side. The, it's, it's the demand. Do we in the global South see the need to shape our policies based on evidence? You know, so it's, it's at times we, we, we always look at the problem from the surprise side, but the demand side. There have been so many times where you meet policymakers, and no matter how you have simplified the evidence, they are not interested because they are driven by petty political, you know, uh, 
incentives and other things. So I think the issue is that if the demand is not there, no matter how the surprise side work, it will not match. So what, what some of the organizations are doing is how do we work with the policymakers and practitioners in the global south to prepare them and prepare their appetites for them to absorb and consume the evidence, no matter how it is. In, in, in my country, in Ghana, they said, if you have something in your mouth, you can wait for the one on the fire, isn't it? But we don't have anything in our mouth. So no matter what is coming, we don't have any appetite for it. So my thinking is more, and that is why I talk about the value chain. At times you go to most of the African countries and Jane here and I have shared a lot of things. You will see that most of the appointment, government appointments are appointed by people who were university professors, who were evidence generators. But they go there and they don't, they act as if they haven't even seen it. So how do we increase the demand? I think that will be my side. So Thank it's you. not only the financing, but the global south issue of demanding for evidence. Thank you. Let's hear from Pep. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Just adding on to what uh, David has said, maybe putting, a, putting it differently. Yes, um, we have the North, uh, the foundations, the bilaterals and so forth, having the resources. They have their own, what I would say, they have their own strategic plans. They do have the markets that they actually are driving and they need their organizations, whether in the global north or in the global south to actually achieve this mandate. But, but I think uh, for us, where we come in and how we do it different is that uh, though they have their own agenda, then when we take it, we want to try to ensure that we are doing it in our own way, in our own context. For instance, we've talked in our approach about the locally generated evidence, ensuring that all research and policy engagement is actually Rockery red. So though they come with, can I say the surprise? I, I mean, I mean, the, 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 their point of view is surprise. We look at the demand. What is the demand from the localities? If it is a climate change, for instance, in Ethiopia, uh, what are the priorities on the ground? And this is where our researchers will work with policymakers and say that. Though really we were working on a Global Affairs Canada project on climate change, uh, that is what they wanted. We look at that as the supply uh, point of view. We want to approach it from the demand side. Go to Ethiopia, look for local researchers who are interested in this area and uh, who can then work with policy makers who can identify the actual uh, policy issues related to climate change, they work together and then we support them with the funds and with the capacity building aspects. I think that's what I would say. Thank you. I could ask Marjorie, is there, do I have time to add something? We're going to circle back to you All to right. hold that thought, Jane. I want uh, Ligia to get a chance to. Um, so very quickly, just three main mechanisms, really. Um, first of all, we're here. Um, <laughs> so, um, and for me, uh, being here, and I first came to this event when it was held in London, and that's how I met Howard, that's how the maps then came about. Um, for me, it was always meant to be a strategic uh, partnership, if you like, as well as something very practical, you know, what types of tools, what do I need to do to have the best systematic reviews, etc. So I always looked at this relationship as something for the longer term that can grow. So underdeveloped, but certainly uh, with that in mind. The second mechanism is very much for the homelessness sector. So we work very closely with our partners, the Institute of Global Homelessness. Um, they work very closely with UN, and for instance, we fed into the report that the Secretary General published in October on homelessness. Um, so uh, very much a statement of, of intent. Um, uh, it will be very hard to implement across the globe, but a really important uh, step. And then we also have bilateral relationships with partners that work in the field uh, in different countries uh, in the world. And that tends to be, um, I suppose, uh, more about knowledge sharing and so essentially the center being there to support them uh, when they need to achieve certain things locally as well. Again, 
all three mechanisms. There's a lot more potential uh, in all of them, um, but we're always open to new partnerships that can really help place the mission uh, in the right places and with the right people. Thank you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you, Sharma Waddington, and then I'm going to ask Jane to be the one to respond to that first. Okay, and then you can also add your comment in. So you, Sharma, hopefully you have a question for Jane. If not, change your question. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> no, go ahead. Go okay, ahead. so thanks for the, for the opportunity. Um, so I was actually picking up on a, a point that David made in his talk that I think is applicable to everybody, which is about representation of, um, um, on, so when we're producing our rigorous evidence, um, I think that we, we often talk about rigor and relevance. So we want it to be high quality and we want it to be on relevant topics. I think that we should add a third category when we're defining quality, which is representation. And it's, as David said, it's representation of those people either from or from the context in which the interventions have been conducted or those people who, who might have lived experience of the interventions which are being carried out. So, um, um, they're, they're actually in the field I work in. This used to be quite a big thing, but it seems to have rolled backwards. So this is this is in the field of international development, for example. And there's there's quite a big movement for decolonization. So my question is, um, what do panelists think can be done either on the supply or the demand side of rigorous research to ensure that we get this representation, so we get the questions right and we get the um, representation of people with lived experience. Thank you. Fantastic. I'll give David a chance to think about it while I give Jane a chance to comment on the previous issue and if you want to comment on this one as well. Mar Marjorie, sorry. Yes. Um, actually, that links directly to the point I wanted to make to add on Jane. But for us at PEP, when we apply for funding, for research funding, we are a locally led research type of organization. So we're very clear that despite the broad theme that we're applying for the funding, in the, the, the specific research questions will be determined by the local researchers in consultation with the research users. And like I said earlier, we engage with a broader set of, consult, uh, of stakeholders who are uh, related to the issue. And so the specific research questions don't come with the proposal. It comes later on through the process. So for us, it's a that's part of what we do. We make sure that the research represents the actual needs and, and uh, yeah, priorities of, of the ground. Uh, David, give you 30 seconds if you can, please. Okay. You uh, recently I travel with one of the PS from Kenya in Washington. And I and and I asked him, how do you guys make policy? And he started laughing at me. And he said, you see those young, young economists we have in the ministry, when an issue comes, we take them to Mombasa, they go and sit down, and the one who talks the loudest, you know, is the one whose idea are used to formulate policy. So I said, so how do we get them? He said, David, and it's what Pep have been doing, involve them involve them, involve them. So one of our research that is going on in Kenya, we have involved the government ministries, the Ministry for Agriculture, the extension offices to be part of the research team. And we are seeing a big impact. And I think PEP have done it for so many years. And that is some of the things that we are doing. I think I'm out of time, the way Peter is looking at it. <laughs> Thank you. Let's continue this discussion over coffee. But first of all, an enormous thank you, thank you, thank you. And don't move from your seats, but thank you. While we've got you all here, we want you to sign up for September 2024. Miroslav, take it away. Okay, excellent. Hello, everyone. Good morning. All right, so it's uh, my great pleasure and honor uh, to invite you uh, for the Global Evidence Summit in Prague next year. But first of all, 
happy birthday. Uh, and actually today we all have a birthday because we celebrate the World Evidence-Based Healthcare Day. So that's, uh, that's, uh, that's for all of us. But anyway, congratulations to this brilliant event. Uh, normally we have the, in, in the last session, that is the last plenary session. So it's a uh, great pleasure to invite you all for the next year. We shall be Global Event Summit in the Prague, in the Czech Republic. Here is a, a QR code you can scan uh, for the website, what is already there. So you will see uh, the program there, uh, the scientific committee members, the program partners, uh, because there is uh, quite a lot of colleagues on the board uh, already with us. And uh, next year, uh, there will be no single Campbell conference, no single GBI conference, Cochrane or GIN, because there will be only one, something I myself call Olympic Games of Evidence-Based Healthcare, <laughs> which is the Global Evidence Summit. And uh, uh, so that will be, that will be uh, exciting. Here is the, the program, what we uh, put together. So the Sustainable Development Agenda, uh, the main program teams, research integrity, making evidence accessible, power of synergy in evidence synthesis and synthesis products. And I'll stop here because this is particle uh, important team. Uh, we will be calling for the joint method workshops, joint sessions will be in collaboration of all organizations who are in the field of evidence-based healthcare. Not only those who are the main partners, but actually all who are the program partners levels. So that will be one of the important criteria for the, for the evaluation. Then evidence translation and implementation, advocating for greater evidence communication and use of evidence and from global evidence to local impact. Uh, here is the picture uh, from the Cochrane Colloquia. You can see all members of the GOC, uh, the executive directors uh, uh, who are forming the GOC. And then on the GIN conference, we are also promoting uh, the Global Evidence Summit. Here is some part of the, our scientific committee. Uh, and uh, here is the uh, current all scientific committee. We are still, uh, there will be two, three or more members who will, will join us. I have a privilege uh, to chair the scientific committee together with my uh, excellent vice chairs, uh, Carla Suarez Weiser and uh, Holger Schunemann. And then we have uh, uh, many colleagues who are uh, uh, leaders of the organizations who joined uh, the Global Evidence Summit uh, together uh, with us. And who is a local host? Who are us? Well, uh, we are uh, from the National Institute of Health uh, excellence and quality of care uh, under the Ministry of Health, uh, having in our country Cochrane Czech Republic, Czech GBI, uh, Center of Excellence, Czech Great Network, and we are the gym member. And maybe soon we also be members of the Campbell family, we will see. Uh, here is some of the uh, nice picture of the Prague, the Charles Bridge. So something, you know, to show you, yeah, that will be a high and very good scientific content, but you know, also something to see in Prague, which will be slightly disturbing us, but uh, I think it's a nice observation. Uh, this is the venue, O2 Universum, venue for 4,000 delegates. Uh, so hopefully we all will fit. And, uh, and uh, this is already the gala dinner place, the municip municipal house, uh, which uh, I believe will be uh, Fantastic, uh, fantastic for, for all who join. And uh, uh, here again, you can, you can scan and we prepared a very short video of the, of the Prague. Come on, let's get ready, you know where we're heading, giving a job, living a life, we're gonna hit the heights. When the clock strikes midnight, we don't stop till daylight. So banish your blues, polish your shoes, we're gonna hit the heights. When I lose my head, I feel my body sway. When I hear that Creole music start to play. Gotta find that feeling when your mind starts reeling. Ready to blow, ready to go, 
We're gonna hit the highest skinny boards. I go real dizzy and I lose control. When I feel that rhythm burning in my soul I said, come and get it Cause you won't regret it Follow the drum, get out of the slum We're gonna hit the heights I said, follow the drum, get out of the slum Get forth the neon lights We're gonna hit the heights 